Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? My Lord, the Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon thankful for life, thankful for the blessings. We pray you'll be with Elder Aldo Boucher as he brings to us the word. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to teach and lead and guide us and we ask that you'll bless this meeting. Be with your people everywhere. We pray that you hold the, the airwaves too so that nothing happens. And so we ask that you'll, for the presence of our Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Going to start with a song called When He Was On The Cross, I Was On His Mind. person to be saved that's the kind of saviour we serve amen welcome everyone and we'd like to, like to welcome um, elder Aldo and Boshe again um, uh, we've been blessed with the message this week and uh, we look forward to mercy and justice thank you the time is yours amen um, it's a very good song for this study I must admit so praise the Lord um, praise him indeed Okay, so as you can see today, Bridget, the topic is entitled Mercy and Justice. Now, there is um, a quite a bit to read today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take it very, very slow. 
I may have to um put it into this thing um um because of how much to cover, right? But um just quickly try to move this away. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so as I was saying, by the way, it's a lot to cover in this in this topic. It's a very broad and detailed topic to cover. So I'll take my time. I'll take my very, very time and go through by God's grace. And um, so before, I may do it in two parts because of how detailed it can be, right? What I will know for to do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, hallowed be your name. Lord, holy is your name. And holy, holy thou art. Father, we come before you at this present moment, Lord. We know that, Lord, our life depends upon it. And so we pray, Lord, for the mercy and, and um, for your blessing upon our hearts, dear Father, that you has designed this principle to save us from ourselves. Be it my mind, I pray, Lord, and my heart as well as I go through your word with your people. And Father, may you forgive me of my sins as well, dear Lord. I ask thee, please, as I come before you, Lord, and the Virgin as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me begin this study with a, with a question, right? Or, or should I say two questions? Um, if I was to ask you, what is mercy? How would you define mercy to be, brethren? Define to me what is mercy. Anyone? It's a very quick, simple um, answer. What is mercy? Anyone? It's a gift. Uh, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor or a gift. Amen. Awesome. Wonderful answers, right? Okay, so if I if I merge those two thoughts together, right? It's a gift, it's unmerited favor, right? To to pardon us from the penalty of sin, which is death, right? But that penalty of sin is not just, just death, it's the second death. So when Christ died for us, right, he died for all humanity, the second death to give us mercy, right? And so mercy is the pardoning from the penalty of the second death. That's what mercy really is. It's a gift, unmerited favor given to you and I, right? Now, again, what would you describe to me as justice? How would you define to me, brethren, justice? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. I'll say. The, Sorry, go on, brother. The uh, I was going to say, but I was going to use the same word again. I was going to say the 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 just. Uh, a requirement of the law. Okay, okay, okay. So the law demands death, right? And so, so justice is saying that all should have died because the law requires death. So justice is receive is receiving the penalty for sin, right? So it's the opposite of mercy. So how can God um, bring these? two principles together when they're polar opposites, right? They're polar opposites, right? And, and so, but the Lord himself can do this and you will see why. And let me say this, both, both mercy and justice requires one thing, that is death. Because for mercy to be given, death is required, right? And the law is saying, um, you know, the sinner needs to be received justice. So this also requires death as well. So both principles requires death. Hence the reason why in Calvary's cross, both principles sufficed, right? Because they, they were both um, 
receive um, the due reward at Calvary's cross. Mercy was given in the face of still being just. Right? Okay. Now, let's begin with the book of Psalms 89 verse 14. The Bible reads, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth go before thy face. Now, brethren, let me start by saying this to you all, that the Lord himself is full of mercy, is full of mercy, is plenteous in mercy, but he's also a just God, right? He's also a very just God. Now, let's take our minds back to heaven where everything began, right? Now, one of the greatest lies that was told by Satan is that God is not merciful nor just. Because if God was to, if God is just, then he can't show mercy. And on the other hand, if God is mercy, he can't be just, right? So he's saying, listen, God, you cannot do both, right? Now, and by doing this, he's trying to put God in a corner. But what Lucifer doesn't know is that you cannot fight infinite wisdom, right? You cannot fight infinite wisdom, right? Now, Lucifer does know angels, sorry, does not know, sorry, Lucifer does know that angels cannot read a heart, read a heart. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to deceive them. But he also doesn't know that God can read his heart. Yeah? And so therefore, when the claim went forth that, about God's character, at first it seems believable because some were deceived. They believed the lie. They believed the lie that God's laws is unjust. Right? This goes on. You see, brethren, you can't, Lucifer could not outwit, outwit God. Or should I say, Lucifer cannot outwit infinite wisdom. But what he can do is make heavenly beings doubt it. Have, have question mark in regard to God's character. Right? You see, because they cannot read Remember, angels cannot read the heart of God, right? So therefore, they don't know if these claims are true or not. Hence why some were, some were deceived. And even those who, those who still remain in heaven, they had question marks in their mind about God's character, right? Therefore, had God told them, angels, listen, I am merciful. I am loving. I am all these good things. The question would be, how do we know this? How can we prove this, Lord? We have never seen mercy before. Right? No. No. So therefore, for God to demonstrate his character, that would require time. So time must be allowed for God's name to be vindicated. Right now, Lucifer's idea of mercy is that God should condone his deceptive foolishness, right, and his sinfulness, which is a wrong concept of mercy. A matter of fact, Lucifer's um, claim in regard to mercy is echoed by many professed believers today that mercy should cover their sinfulness. In other words, mercy should condone their foolishness. No, mercy is given to bring us from those foolishness, to bring us from those sinfulness that we can walk in his grace, right? Mercy was never designed to condone wickedness, right? But again, this is a wrong context or concept of mercy. Now, the question is, did Christ show them the principle of mercy in heaven? Yes, he did. The question is, with who? Let's read. 
Sorry. Sorry. And it says, God bore long with Lucifer. Now, brethren, the word bearing long, that means mercy was shown to him. Right? So mercy was bearing long with Lucifer. It wasn't an overnight thing. It wasn't a, a spur of the moment. It was a long period of time because mercy was trying to bring him back from the abyss of ruin, right? And so mercy was bearing long with him. The spirit of discontent was a new element, strange, unaccountable. Lucifer himself did not see whether he was drifting. But such effort as infinite love and wisdom could only devise were made to convince him of his error, right? So infinite love and wisdom, which is God's mercy, is now showing him of his errors, right? So mercy, mercy, isn't, mercy isn't just to just try to bring us back from ruin. It's also designed to show us our errors as well. That's what true mercy is, right? So as we can see, mercy was trying to show him of his error and bring him back to his true position. Let's read. He was made to see what will be the result of persisting in revolt. So he was shown clearly through God's mercy what would happen if he continued on this pathway. Goes on. Lucifer was convinced that he was wrong. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy, holy in all his works. Psalm 145, verse 17. That the divine statues are just and that they are to, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. So he's seen, right? What he had done wrong. He's seen. How far he has now gone. Why? Because of God's mercy. Right? This is the power of mercy, brethren. Mercy is to show us where we're going wrong and, and to convict us of wrongdoing as well. That's what true mercy is. It goes on. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. If he had been willing to return to God, satisfied to fill the place appointed to him in God's great plan, he, had, he would have been reinstated in his office. So Lucifer was a what? A covering cherub based on the book of Ezekiel, right? So he's, he left his office of a covering cherub and began to spread lies about God's character. Now, had he repented, right? Had he repented, remember, he couldn't repent without mercy. So mercy was given to him, right? Now, had he, had he repented, God would have put him back into his original office as a covering cherub, right? Goes on. The time had come for a final decision. So, Bridget, what does that mean? Does that mean mercy stopped pleading for him? Or is he a case where Mercy could do no more, right? Mercy could do no more for Lucifer. He has now re rejected mercy. It's not because mercy stopped for him. He is now consistently rejecting it. Hence now the time for a final um, decision to be made. Quote goes on. He must yield to divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion. He nearly reached the decision to return, but pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error. Right? Now, again, this is a mouthful, to, this is a mouthful to, to unpack. Right? Now, we're seeing mercy in its clearest light. Right. And so because mercy was rejected. Right. He had to now receive justice. 
but his justice was partial. And his partial justice was that Lucifer, you cannot remain in heaven anymore. Right? His full just his, his full penalty of justice will receive in the seven in, in the um the lake of fire. And as Jesus says, the lake of fire was designed for the devil and his angels. Right? So when he left heaven, that was his partial justice. His full and complete one will come in the lake of fire. Right? Right? So as you can see, Lucifer was the first one who had experienced mercy, but rejected it. Hence the reason why justice now began to come into effect. Because there was nothing more to be done for him, being a covering cherub. Right? I see there's two persons to come into the room, please. Let's let's go on. <clears throat> so as we can see, Lucifer was offered mercy, but he refused. It's not the case where mercy stop, but of a truth, mercy could do no more. And because he could no do no more, he received his partial justice. Now Christ showed them this godly principle. When Lucifer sinned, but they did not. But the heavenly beings didn't fully grasp the concept due to the deceptive nature of, of of Satan. They couldn't grasp it, right? Now God has to demonstrate His character to the heavenly beings, and by doing this, the entire host of heaven can understand and learn about God's character, right? Now, why am I saying this? When God made man, he already knew that they would have sinned. But God's foreknowledge doesn't affect their choice. Should they sin, God already made a plan for their salvation. And the angels would learn about the wisdom through his dealing with man. Just to be clear, brethren, just to be clear, God didn't need sin to show his true character. Right, but when sin came in, his character was still revealed either way. Right, either way. Let's read. Yes, okay. Now, before we discourse right here. Right, let's go to um Genesis chapter Genesis chapter um chapter one, please. Sorry, chapter three. Now, as we know the story of um Genesis, that man sin, right? And when man sin, right, Lucifer, man was deceived by the acts of Lucifer, right? And so when man sin, right, the heavenly beings in heaven. They they expect God to respond, right? Because remember, when man sin, they expect God to respond, right? Now, the question is, what did they expect God to do, right? They expect God to respond in a just manner because in their minds at the time, they didn't see how, how mercy could be seen in sin, right? So now... When they sinned in have in um Garden of Eden, right? The heavenly beings expected God to respond in a in a in a arbitrary way, right? Let's read. With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. Now Remember, these are beings who are still perfected, right? So how could they have in their mind that God, when man sin, God would just wipe us, wipe us all out completely? Those thoughts that they had about God's character was put there by the devil himself, right? So their thoughts, even though they had not sinned, their thoughts about God had changed. Because of the because of the 
deceptive nature of sin, right? And so she's saying that with, in with intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah rise and sweep away all of us completely. And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. Had He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness, what? Impossible. So he's saying, listen, there's no way that man can be forgiven because God is so just and almighty. And for God to be just, Mercy can't be seen. But let's read on. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusation were proved true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. Right? So had God destroyed the earth when man sinned, right? The whole claim about God's character, right? The whole world would have believed it. That God's, God is not merciful. Right? It goes on. But instead of destroying the world, God sent his son to save it. Amen. Amen. And when the fullness of time had come, the deity was glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withdrawn Till the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. Right? And so as you can see, right, this sin problem that when, when it came in, right, it requires infinite wisdom to respond to it. Right? But the other beings who are watching, watching, they couldn't comprehend or understand what was happening at this point in time. And they, they couldn't comprehend it. Because unlike us, unlike us human beings who can look back and say, well, this happened, they were living in, in real time, real time. And so therefore, they couldn't understand this, what, what's taking place in its severity. Only God alone could see the far reaching nature of what sin really is. No one else understood how far it would go except God, right? And so therefore, God has to respond using infinite wisdom, right? Infinite wisdom. Now, so now as you can see, once again, when man sinned, God's character now is on the line before the heavenly beings. Now, how God respond? So this action of man sinning will affect how they view his character. So how, so how we, so, so, so therefore, they would understand God's character through his church. Let me say that one more time. The heavenly beings, they understand God's character even more so, even more so now, as though God has dealing with his church. Again, why am I saying this? Chapter 3 of Ephesians 9 verse 10. The Bible reads, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Virgin, what is a mystery? Mystery means it's unknown. Right? It's unknown. Right? So to make all men see this mystery, which from the beginning of the world, hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now listen to this key part now. To the intent that no one to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So therefore how God is constantly dealing with his church the heavenly beings are seeing Oh, wow. Now we understand the mercy of Jesus Christ. Now we can see that God is a just and loving God. Right? Because you're seeing how he's dealing with his church 
from the beginning of, of, of sin when he first came in. Right? Now, let's, let's read this quote right here. And this quote will give some, some, some clarity as well. Even when it was decided that he could no longer remain in heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Now, the question is, why would that be? Why wouldn't infinite wisdom destroy Satan? Because infinite wisdom can see everything. Infinite wisdom understand the severity of the whole controversy in its context. And infinite wisdom is making a, is, is, is making a decision for eternity, right? That, that, that finite beings at that time couldn't understand. Again, let's see why. Let's, let's, see, let's see how infinite wisdom is seeing this controversy in real time. Let's read. Since the service of love can only be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven and of other worlds, so heavenly beings and other worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, right? Remember, they, they were unprepared because how can you be, how can you be, how can, how, can, how can someone, how can a finite being prepare for something that they don't even know existed? Or they, they, they don't even understand, right? So, so these finite beings were unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, could not have seen the justice and mercy of God in this in destroying Satan. Right? That's powerful. So, in other words, had God killed him there and then, they couldn't see at that point in time how God would have been just at that point in time to kill Satan. They would not, they, they would not, they would never have understand it. Because they, they weren't prepared to even comprehend the nature of what sin really was. Right? It goes on. Had he been immediately blotted out from existence, they would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion have been utterly eradicated. So, Virgin, by killing Satan, it wouldn't have solved nothing. A matter of fact, it have made it far, far worse. Right? Because infinite wisdom is seeing this thing in its clearest light. Right? And infinite wisdom can't be questioned because it's infinite. Right? And so God is now seeing, okay, fine. If I kill him right now, she's saying that the influence of the deceiver, remember, the whole world had already been influenced by the, by the sin problem. Right? And so she says, the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion be been eradicated. So therefore, it, it wouldn't have solved nothing. It goes on. Evil must be permitted to come to maturity. Now, why is that? Why would a loving God allow evil to come to maturity? Let's see why. For the good of the entire universe, through ceaseless ages, Satan must more develop his principles. Why? Is because they didn't understand Lucifer's heart. They didn't understand the nature of sin at this point in time. And so therefore, God must allow time to come in. And by time, the question would have been answered. Right? And the question was answered partly, or should I say, to, to a large degree at Calvary's cross. Right? But let's go on. She says, For the good of the entire universe, through ceaseless ages, 
Satan must more fully develop his principles that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings, right? So that means every single being will see, will see Lucifer fully unmasked, fully unmasked. But this unmasking would not have happened if he would have been destroyed. This unmasking requires time for it to happen. And that's why infinite wisdom allow evil to come to maturity. Right? Goes on. She says that the, that, that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law might forever be placed beyond all question. So brethren, when this thing come to a close, no one will never ever again say that God is not just or he's not merciful. Because how he respond to the sin problem was using infinite wisdom and how he managed it was through mercy and justice. Right? Remember this again. If you go to um, um, Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah 4, sorry, Isaiah 12, should I say? Um, sorry, sorry, um, Isaiah 14, please. My mistake, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Right, remember, remember, angels could, could not read his heart, right? And But yes, still, God can. And God can see what's taking place, right? Isaiah 14 verse um verses um 12 to 12 and 13 says this How art thou one from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the what? Congregation in the sight of the north. Brethren, he was saying these things in his heart. And the heavenly beings could not read his heart. And so therefore, for his heart to be fully exposed or to be fully seen in its clearest light, even must, even must come to maturity. Time was required. Right? Time was required. Now, with that being said, right, let's go to the second book of Exodus. Sorry, second book of the Bible, Exodus 25, verse 17. Right? Now, we're, we're going to go back to, you know, the, 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 the heavenly beings. The heavenly beings, there's, they, they, learn, they learn about God's character through how God's dealing with his church, right? So how God respond to you and I, right? And how God handle his church from the Garden of Eden up until now. God's character has been on display and the heavenly beings are seeing God's wisdom in how he's dealing with his church. And you're seeing that God is a merciful and just God by how we respond to how this, this sin problem and how we respond to his church as well. The Bible reads. Now this is not bringing to view. The Santura message. Right. The Bible reads. And thou shalt make a mercy seat. Of pure pure gold. Two cubits. And a half shall be lent thereof. And a cubit. And a half. The breadth thereof. And thou shalt make. Two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work. Thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on the other end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall he make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another. Towards the mercy seat shall the face of shall the faces of the cherubims be. Now, Bridget, 
why am I reading the scripture? This is not the sanctuary message that was built by Moses, right? Now he's now God is now telling Moses how to know them also how to build the most holy place, right? And on the Ark of the Covenant, you have two cherubims, right? Their wings falling over, and their faces, their faces looking down into something, right? It says, um, it says. And their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat, shall the fate of the cherubims be. So the cherubims, when they were made by Moses, now again, these are these are typology, by the way, right? These, these, these figures, right, they are made with their faces looking down upon the mercy seat, right? Now, again, that's not by chance. Nothing God do is by chance. Right, it is a reason that these the, these cherubims who were somewhat of figures they were looking down upon the mercy seat. So the question is that, Bridget, what were they looking at or looking for? Or should I say, what is the reason why they were made to look down upon mercy seat? Now, this is a um a symbol of the um the photo. Of what it looks like, right? As you can see, the angels are looking over, right, into something. Now, now, as you can see, this is very, very clear, a very simple but profound photo, right? Profound photo. Now, I never understood why their faces were looking down, right? And now I begin to understand why. Now, just to be clear, brethren, the temple of the earth is only a type of the heavenly one, right? But so therefore, in the in, in the heavenly temple, there is no angels as 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 type. They're they're literal real angels in heaven, right? So it, it won't be it won't be like what we see in the photo right here. In heaven, it will be a living experience, as in living angels. And there won't be no no, no, no figures. It will be living angels. So the, these living angels, they are still looking into the mercy seat, even right now. Why? It's because through the mercy seat, right, they will understand the gravity of salvation. You see why I'm saying that? Let's read this. Let's read this, by the way, quickly. This um, this quote in the temple in heaven. Now, this this quote right here will make it even more more pertinent. And matter of fact, it was this quote that the whole sermon was built around. Right, this quote right here. It says, "In the temple in heaven, the dwelling place of God, His throne is established in righteousness and judgment. In the most holy place is His law." The great rule of right by which all mankind are tested, right? The ark that enshrines the table of the law is covered with, excuse me, excuse me. The ark that enshrines the table of the law is covered with the mercy seat, right? So the law of God is covered with what? The mercy seat before which Christ pleads his blood. In the sinner's behalf. So before the so they, so therefore, but before the law, so the over the law is covering what? The mercy seat. And that's where Christ now pleads for the sinners. Right? So he's pleading for the sinners, right? Bef bef before, before mercy and justice. Let's read. Thus is represented the union of what? Justice and mercy. In the plan of human redemption. Powerful. Therefore, human redemption was not possible without these two eternal principles. So, therefore, for us to be saved, it requires God to be just. But also, for us to be saved, it requires God to be merciful as well. Right? It requires both. And this union 
right? Should have never been separated. As she said, that I remember, it's a union. That mean what? They coexist as one, right? They coexist as one. Let's read. This union, infinite wisdom alone could devise. And infinite power accomplished it. So not only infinite wisdom divine salvation or planned salvation, only infinite power could make it even come into effect. Right? She says, it is a union. What union? Mercy and justice. It is that union that fills all heaven with wonder and adoration. Why? Let's see why. The no, she's not bringing her minds back to the earthly cherubims now. The term, the cherubims of the earthly sanctuary, looking reverently down upon the mercy seat. Remember the old typology, and she's now linking it back to heaven typology now. Represent the interests with which heavenly host, so the heavenly host, co contemplate the work of redemption. Right. So when God made the angels now. In the in earthly sanctuary, looking down, they were looking into salvation. And by looking into salvation, they're seeing the character of Jesus on this in, on full display. Full display. And now they're in awe, like, wow, what a wonder to us. Let's read, let's 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 let, let's, let's go on. She says, This is the mystery of mercy. Now, brethren, I'm sure mystery, I'm sorry, I'm sure mercy is not to you and I a mystery because we know what mercy is. So the question is, who was mercy a mystery to? It was the heavenly beings. They never understood or know what mercy would look like. They never know it because, they, because sin never happened. In, sin wasn't in heaven. So if sin was not there, mercy wasn't required. And so it's like, wow, they're in awe. How can God still be just while still saving sinners by his mercy? It goes on. This is the mystery of mercy into which angels desire to look. That God can be just while he justifies the repentant sinner and renews his intercourse with the fallen race. Right? That Christ could stoop to raise unnumbered multitudes from the abyss of ruin and clothe them with the spotless garments of his own righteousness to unite with angels who have never fallen and to dwell forever in the presence of God. So brethren, if you and I make it to heaven, the angels are saying, Lord, it is because of your grace, your mercy, why I am here. Anyone who make it to heaven is up on the merits of Jesus Christ. And the angels would, would have known this because they've been studying salvation. It's, it's so, so wonderful, right? That th to them, mercy was a mystery, right? But And so therefore, now it's no longer for them a mystery anymore. Because the Lord himself began to unveil this thing with time. That's why infinite wisdom had to divine this whole thing. Right? Now, man, this is so wonderful. Praise the Lord. Um, so each time, brethren, each time I overcome my sin, it is because of grace that was given to me through God's mercy. How I treat my brother in Christ Jesus is by his mercy, right? And so how, I'm, how I respond to, to, um, to sin as, 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 a, as a sinner myself, how I respond to sin and overcome my weaknesses, the heavenly beings are saying, Lord, it is because of your mercy why this sinner have the victory over sin. It is by your mercy why that person is make it. Like they're seeing all these things and they're saying, wow, Lord, we never know you were this loving. 
And now they can see it on full display because what? They're looking into salvation. Right? Now, Numbers 14, verse 17 and 18, the Bible reads, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my, of my Lord be great, according to as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. Right? So you can see there's a balance. The Lord is what? Great in mercy. Excuse me, mercy. And forgiving iniquity. But he was no wise brethren. Clear the guilty. Because God's character is fully, fully balanced with mercy and justice. Let's go on. In the opening of the, of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent with mercy, right? And that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned, right? Now, listen, listen to his words now. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice right so he's saying listen god you can't really forgive sin because if you forgive sins that means you can't be just right it goes on when men brought the law of god and defiled his will satan exalted it was proved he declared that the law could not be obeyed man could not be forgiven right because he after his rebellion had been banished from heaven. Satan claimed that the human race must forever shut, forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be ur just, he urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. So he's saying, he's saying, God, you can't do it. That's not possible, right? But God is infinite wisdom, right? And, and so therefore, God has the power to do this you know how through his son jesus christ right and so so when christ gave his life for humanity it proved that 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 um, mercy was suffice uh, alongside justice as well hence in, hence, in, hence i said in the beginning that the beginning that both these principles they both dovetail in Calvary's cross because both mercy and justice, both of these principles require death. They both required death. And so therefore, Christ had to die to prove that he can, fill, he can fulfill both these eternal principles. Now, in Psalm 85, the Bible reads, Surely is his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that, the, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have what? Peace each other. Now, David is prophesying in regard to Calvary's cross, right? And he's saying, listen, a time will come where mercy and truth and, you know, will we'll kiss the Calvary's cross, right? It's the, it's the first time where mercy and justice, they met and they kissed because they both were suffice at Calvary's cross. Now, I'm mindful of time, but I want to end, if you give me, brethren, just 10 minutes, and I'll end within the, in the next 10 minutes. Okay, brethren, please do, right? Now, let's go to Zechariah 3, 1 to 9. Sorry, Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 4. Now, Zechariah is now quoting from, uh, he's now looking at the high priest called Joshua, right? And this right here is, is a wonderful demonstration of God showing these two principles in regard to mercy and justice. And Ellen White, the way how she, she expounded upon this, this subject is so wonderful. But let's read. Zechariah 3, 1-4, the Bible says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest, 
standing before the angels of the Lord and Satan standing at the right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is this not the brand plucked out of the fire? No, Joshua was clothed with what? Filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garment from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have, cast, I have called thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now, the reason why the Lord, Lord can do this is because he have the power to do it. Right? And that power was in his son, Jesus Christ. Right? And so, so therefore, let's see how Ellen White now take this scripture and she expound upon it in a more great and wonderful way. Right? Satan knows that those who ask God for pardon and grace will obtain it. Now, brethren, if the devil knows that, the question is, do you know that? Do I know that? Because the devil knows it, right? She says, therefore, he present their sin before them to discourage them. Against those who are trying to obey God, he is constantly seeking occasion for complaint. Even their best and most acceptable service, he seeks to make appear corrupt. By countless devices, the most subtle and most cruel, he endeavors to secure their condemnation. Goes on. In his own strength, man cannot meet the charges of the enemy. Brethren, we can't. And we can't meet the charges. You know why? Because they are true charges, brethren. Right? We all have sinned before the Lord. Right? So we can't say, well, we haven't sinned. We have. Right? But by God's grace and his mercy, we can claim and say, Lord, because I've forgiven of my sins, those sins have no power over me anymore. But we in our strength can never meet these charges on our own strength. It goes on. In, in sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. Let's read on. He, Satan, so this is, this is, so this is now Satan now talking to God. He pronounces them as deserving of himself from exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven? And the place of the angels who are, in, who are what? With me? They profess to obey the law of God. But have they kept his precepts? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Have they not placed their own interests above his service? Have they not loved the things of this world? Now, these are true things. Now, Lucifer is not bringing to God. Lucifer is not saying God to God. Listen. These are your people. Look at their lives, right? Look at their lives. They profess to serve you, but look at their, they, 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 they profess to serve you, but look at their lives. It goes on. Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred for one another. Will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet reward those who are guilty of the same sin? It's a good question to ask, right? But let's read on. Thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Justice demand that sentence be pronounced against them. Now again, he has a claim to make. So he's saying, listen, these people are sinners, right? Enough of truth. We're not, we're not um, you know, we're not, you know, deserving of God's mercy. Because we're not. Right? But listen, look how God handled this problem. Remember, he, he, he's not bringing to God these claims. And these claims are true about God's people. 
But let's read on. The tempter stands, the tempter stands by to accuse them as he stood by to resist Joshua. He points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. He presents their weaknesses and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer. He endeavors to affright them with the thought that their case is hopeless, that the stains of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptation and turn from allegiance to God. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sin that he has tempted God's people to commit. And he urges, and he urges his accusation against them, declaring that by their sins, they have forfeited divine protection and claiming, <coughs> excuse me, and claiming that he has the right to destroy them. Virgin, he has a claim to make. Why? Because we're sinners. But this last quote will put the question, the, the, the thoughts to bed. Let's read. But while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves up to be controlled by satanic agencies. They have repented of their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition. And the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude, who knows their sin and also their penitence declares, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. I gave my life for these souls. They are graven upon the palms of my hands. They may have imperfection of character. They may have failed in their endeavors, but they have repented and I have forgiven them and accepted them. Brethren, that is mercy. That is mercy, right? And so that is mercy on full display undeserving to us right i'll uh, end right there for tonight there's a lot to go through but in, in for tonight um so amen 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 any 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 thought virgin so far Any thoughts to share at all? I've said I've said a lot now. Um, so any any thoughts or comments or any anything to share? See Sister Charlene hands. Yes, thank you, brother. What a beautiful message. Really got to see God's love and all this justice, but the incredible mercy and uh, yeah, just makes us love God more. Amen. Amen. Amen, indeed. I see Dorothy hand as well. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for such a beautiful message tonight. I just wanted to ask him, uh, uh, when uh, Satan, uh, when God was ready to forgive Satan, and I believe that he was convicted of yes. his sin yes. uh, because of what the scripture says, you know, you were perfect in beauty until iniquity was found in you. True, true. So when God told Satan that, I don't understand why Satan did not want to accept God's mercy at Amen. that point. Um, can you uh, shed a little bit more light on that? What happened? Why well, did he reject God's mercy? Well, I mean, that's a... Uh, okay, so... To try to give more clarity on the matter, let, let, let's let's go to this quote right here, and this thing this quote gives some gives some clarity to the matter as well. Um, look, look look at the second paragraph. It says Lucifer was convinced that he was wrong. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works, that the divine statues are as just, and that they ought to be acknowledged them as such before all heaven. Now, so he's seen his you know, where he has gone wrong. He's been convinced that he is wrong. 
right? But the last part says this. He nearly reached the decision to return, but pride forbade him. Pride. So, so to answer your question, pride was the reason why he resisted and rejected mercy. And she says, it was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error, which is, which is really pride. And so pride resisted and rejected error, sorry, sorry, rejected truth and just and mercy and justice. You know, it's because of pride in that sense. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. 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 Any more thoughts? Well, I think that court also um, does apply to us as well. Amen. Uh, the, the reason yeah. why um, um, many people are going to be lost is not because God's mercy could not reach them. Amen. Um, but it's because of, I, I think my understanding of pride now in a biblical sense, because you see, God hates pride. On the other side, God loves humility. He says he loves to, to dwell and uh, with, with the humble. And what I've noticed in scripture, repentance mm -hmm. is humility at its best to acknowledge that I am a sinner, I have sinned. Mm -hmm. That is the current or, or the, uh, the attributes of humility. So I think ultimately, um, just like Satan, mm -hmm. anybody who is going to be lost is because of pride, which manifests in unbelief. Amen. And um, yeah, not coming to repentance. Amen. 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 Um, I pray that tonight that it was quite clear for the brethren to understand it. And that uh, the virgin could be blessed and see, you know, the severity of your own salvation and how God designed, you know, the plan of salvation, you know, through infinite wisdom. And I pray that you are all blessed by tonight's study. I'll hand over to Sister, the twins at the moment. Amen. We were Amen. blessed. We were certainly blessed. With the Lord says pride, pride comes before a fall and Satan's fallen lower than any of us. And... Uh, yeah, it's um, pride causes you to do things that you, you know you know it's not right, but it's pride won't let you do any of that, and it's it's very 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 serious um, condition to be in when you're proud. So I'd like to thank uh, Elder Anton, Andon, um, Aldon Bushay Bush for the message. We've certainly been blessed. Um, this is a penultimate one. We've got the final one in this first series tomorrow yeah. i'm sure there's going to be, I'm sure there's going to be there. another series there <laughs> <laughs> praise the lord and we're going to end with a song called were it not for grace
the grace of God in our lives. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sister Dorothy, are you in a position to pray for us, please? Amen. Yes, yes. Your mindful, kind and loving Father who art in heaven, thank you for your mercy and grace. We are so privileged to have your son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior. And we accept by faith such a great sacrifice. We pray that you help us so that we can understand how deep and wide and high your love is when we look at Calvary. We pray that you give us understanding of how offensive sin is. So you gave Jesus Christ to come and pay the penalty for those sins which he had no share. So help us so that we, when we look to Calvary, we can see your great love. And we pray that you help us not to sin against you. Give us power to overcome sin. Take away pride from our hearts because we have seen tonight how pride caused Lucifer to reject God's mercy and to, and he chose his way than God's way. So may you help us always to choose your way because your way is the best way which leads us to salvation. And we ask that you will bless our brother who has given us a message tonight. Give him strength and help him to continue in the good work. We ask that where we have come short of your glory, where we have offended one another, that we will not find it too big a thing to to apologize and to say that we are sorry and to reconcile with our, uh, with one another. Pride is so hidden many a times, Lord, we don't realize that we are proud. But we pray that your Holy Spirit will reveal our pride in every way so that we can be clean before you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin and help us not to reject such a great sacrifice and to prepare others to bring them to the Savior that they may also obtain grace. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Dorothy, for the prayer. And thank you, Elder Elder Bashai, for the message. Um, um, could I say one, point, one, one, one last point, please? Yes. Um, so tomorrow I'll be doing part two of this topic. Again, I couldn't, it's, just, it's so much to go through, but um, but I'll be doing part two tomorrow and I, I, I'll be linking it to the the um, the Mark of the Beast, right? And, and show how that is designed to make, in other words, devil will, the devil will force the mind of man to reject God's mercy. That's really what that's really what it comes down to. It's to compel the conscience to reject God's mercy. And so we'll be looking at looking at how you know how you will you will you know utilize mercy again God's people. So it'll be good to come and listen to part two as well by God's grace. Yes, we look forward to seeing the recording because we're going to a health conference tomorrow. But Sister Arlen will be take it will be standing in for us. No but we look, we look forward to the recording. Yeah, amen. Thank you everyone that's joined and uh, thank you for the prayers and for the message. At 4.45 it will be morning prayer and at 5.30 Desire of Ages, 12 o'clock midday yeah. prayers, 6.30 song service and then the last one in the series from Elder Elder Alden Bushay. Um, just can we have, um, I've, I've put a note on the, the WhatsApp group, um, special prayers for Robert, uh, Elder Robert Tutin Puri. He's in hospital, he's going to be having a bypass operation, heart bypass on Monday. So, so please keep him in prayer. He was, to, he was due to preach in two weeks time on prayer retreat, but 
obviously his, his gut's a rest at least two months, he says, before he'll be up and running again. But keep him in prayer and his wife and family. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. And all roads lead to Kevin Lee. Yes. 23rd to the 29th of December for our winter retreat. So we look forward to that. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.